Um, well, hi, Annie. Hi, Andrew. Good to see you as always. Oh, great. Well, you know, it's been a while, hasn't it? I think it's, it's, always, it's always too long for me, actually. Um, so I'm just going to make sure we've got people coming in the room here. Yeah, we're all great. Let's let people come in. Uh, yeah, well, it's great to see you. And um, uh, this is the first uh, Facebook Live for a little while, actually, because uh, I've been away on holiday, which is always nice. Uh, and um, we had some technical issues with Jack. We must get Jack back. Me and Jack Fenton and I were supposed to be doing a Facebook Live, and then we got... Facebook seems to think there was nudity involved, which is quite random, but there you go. Yeah. Um, hi, Kim. We've got Kim in the room. Good to see you. Say hi, everybody. Oh, they're all coming in now. That's great. Good. Well, we've got the amazing Annie, Annie Phoenix here tonight. We've got a few things I want to talk about. Obviously, you've been in the group before, Annie. Um, and uh, the main thing for talking about tonight is uh, looking at the broader subject of professionalism within the community, really, and to think about some of the things that are making it at times a bit trickier to navigate than perhaps it used to be. That's the impression that many of us think of. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Junie. Hi, Tricia. Hi, Ingrid. Um, uh, and also to look at your amazing initiative that you set up, Ali, the uh, the Phoenix, Ag Phoenix Advocacy uh, Centre. That's right. So we'll come on to that in a moment. But we must start with the exciting news. But finally, it's been it's been a it's been a journey, Annie, hasn't it for you? I know. Uh, your book is about to be. Uh, what well, it is? It's out. It's out now. So yeah, it's um, out. Uh, well, I have an advanced copy. This is the cover. It's been three years in the making, and um, people have been very patient, and I appreciate that. And there's been a lot of reasons why, including paper shortages. But it's finally coming out, and I'm very. It's coming out July fourth, more or less, maybe a little later in the UK. And I'm very excited about it. And I have, um, I mean, I, I love all the information. I mean, really, it changed my life writing this book, which we can talk about why. And I did not Ooh. expect it to. I thought, because I was semi-retired and having a great life and the, the publishing house contacted me and I'm like, I'll do this. I don't want to because it's a lot of work. And then I'm done. This is the final thing I'm doing and it's for dog owners. And so that's why I did it because there's such a need. Um, but my favorite thing is, is I did um, 17 interviews with professionals around the world, including you, you're in the book, which I'm very pleased about. And I actually thank you in the back, which you'll see when you get your copy and the acknowledgements because it was um, beyond the operant that I that just caused me to pause your YouTube, YouTube series because I had been kind of out of the industry. I took myself out because of exhaustion and um, wasn't really involved with groups or anything for four or five years. And when the publisher called me, I said, well, let me put on my journalist hat and say, who's doing who, what, where, when, and why? Who's, who's new or what new ideas are out there? Because The Midnight Dog Walkers, my first book was written in 2016. So I'm like, wow. I want to just revisit that. That's what they wanted. They wanted this to be a second edition of that. And that's, <laughs> that's not what they got. They got a whole new book um, because I had to, because I got so encouraged when I saw Beyond the Operant. Um, I stopped writing and I only had six months to write a book. <laughs> it's a pretty big book. Um, and I just watched all of them back to back. Cause I'm like, what is beyond the opera? What are these people talking about? This is so interesting. And then it's just like light bulb after light bulb after light bulb. And I got excited about the industry because it's, it's not really, I mean, some's new, some of the stuff is new, but it's a new way of reframing what a dog needs and what we owe a dog or what a dog deserves to have in his or her life versus what is a dog going to do for me in terms of obedience and being quiet and not disturbing the family and winning awards or whatever whatever you it may be so the, the book has had a profound impact on my life and for the better and it was meeting all my colleagues and talking with you and others and realizing how much connection we have and how much support we have for one another because of these Zoom talks. Um, we're doing so much more of that. I've talked to more trainers in the last two years than I have in 25 years and gotten to know more, not just because of the book. And like everyone, I asked everybody, except of course, Shay Kelly, he points out that I didn't ask him if, if they're optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the welfare of dogs for the future. Cause I was very pessimistic coming out of rescue and seeing how dogs were treated and the rise of the aversive trainers and franchises and everything else. And they all said positive. And I was like, why? How could you possibly 
B positive and they all were and it just kind of after six months of interviewing and writing the whole book I I did a switch I'm like I get it I I was if you're only online as a trainer or professional and you see all the fighting the infighting then it can be very depressing and you feel alone and you don't know who to trust I think in the in the force free field um and a lot has changed since then I started writing in 2021 so a whole lot has changed in the industry and you guys I call you guys the tip of the spear you and Laura Donaldson and Kim Brophy and some of the others um, and Sarah Fisher that are all in my book um you're pushing the industry forward in, in a way that has never been done before and I felt was badly needed so I feel like the book has kind of captured what's happening with this paradigm shift and um, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a advanced peak myself because I've had the the kind of digital copy to have a look at, and uh, and it's a very generous book, Annie. I think it's a very generous book, both in what you're delivering to the the public, but also reaching out to all these other people. I think, um, uh, which is which is such a cool thing to do, and, and I think it it fits what this outlook is about, actually. Which is a there's two things I think that. And you're right, because there's nothing new under the sun, right? So I think it's just about how we find it and how we perceive it and how we look at things. And the, the two big things for me that I think has shifted is, first of all, this notion of being humble enough to think, well, actually, maybe we could learn from the dog first, actually, rather than just turn up and get them to do stuff. But secondly, the democratization of these conversations. This is what I love about the, the group that we're talking in now, because all these voices have come in as equals. And that includes caregivers, by the way. Not You, know, you don't have to necessarily be a professional to have a, to have an input and that's what the book has captured I think uh, both in the way that you've uh, it has a really lovely narrative to it the book but also um, bringing in lots of different voices and and some of the voices are very big names that people have heard of and some are not mm -hmm. and um, when I kind of took a long view and stepped back from the book I realized that the one thing that these that everyone had in common that I wasn't like I didn't pick out I didn't have a list in mind other than innovative and something that is um for lack of a better word has some meat to it and some science behind it um preferably um but what everybody had is innovation putting the dog's needs first uh, and everyone was a very kind person and that kindness extended to me even though i'm kind of a curmudgeon about many things but particularly the way dogs have been treated by the industry itself especially the for the aversive ones but and the way professionals treat each other that also sticks in my call for a lot of reasons so um, when i realized that that everyone i chose i just kind of naturally gravitated towards because they're not the fighters they're not i mean they're fighting for dogs <laughs> and to, to move the, m everything forward but that's a different fight than i don't like that you have this qualification or you went to that school or you're not friends with so and so and um, all that tribalism like none of, I feel like all the experts are, they, as Denise Hamore says, they have their head down and they're doing their work and they're doing their work on the behalf of dogs and they're serious people. And it's just the kindness, like not one person said no, whether they knew me or not. I knew some and I didn't know most of them when I first started. Um, nobody asked for money, which is good because the publishers don't have any money and they wouldn't have paid. That they, might come, that might come. <laughs> they all took it very seriously and not one person asked me who else is in the book what other mm -hmm. people are talking to which I found fascinating because to me that means you people are very comfortable in what they are doing and their focus and they don't need to be in a book just because so and so is in the book you know and and it was thrilling and I learned so much and they changed me every you guys all put together and I hope that's what the reader gets is the interviews build upon each other because we're in some way we're all saying the same thing, which is please be kind to dogs and let them have be a dog <clears> and express their needs and not not be a little silent human in the house. Um, but it really profoundly changed me, and that's I'm doing things I never expected to do because of the, this process. And I did not expect that from a nonfiction book about dogs, <laughs> for me personally. But I think it comes across, and I think what you're saying there is. Um us all staying quite humble about this I think about learning more uh, and that's what's so exciting right? I, I love all the you know, I get to have, do a lot of these conversations There's about 60 now on the on the YouTube channel and, I, and I'm learning stuff all the time um, and I think when you start moving away from the more arbitrary view of behavior that we used to have in training 
uh, to actually thinking about learning about the individual dogs and their individual experiences. Well, there's just a whole universe of stuff to learn. And so it's so you, it, and actually it makes you feel more comfortable in a way because sometimes you feel overwhelmed by all. Uh, and other times you think, oh my God, it's really exciting. And I think maybe that's why perhaps when you ask that question, it's a really powerful question, an interesting one. And I'd really ask, invite people in the listening in to think about it themselves. You know, do you feel optimistic or pessimistic about this stuff? Possibly the reason that the the, the kind of um, the uh, everybody came back with optimistic is because of the things you're talking about. I think we're all kind of just doing our thing. We see the change it makes to that individual dog in front of us. There are bigger battles to be had, of course. And I think, you know, we can all uh, look at the bigger picture and see about the way that the wind keeps blowing either way and it's a bit tricky. But I think if you stay humble and you think about the dog in front of you, as, as you were saying off air a minute ago, then um, you, you've got to be optimistic about it because it works. Mm -hmm. uh, because it works because it's authentic for that dog. You, you can't really go far wrong if you're listening to that dog first. Yeah. And you said long ago when we first started talking that each of us has our own um, little corner of the world or, or piece of the puzzle in this. And I think one thing I love about the interviews is that it kind of puts all the pieces together. Even though we're all under, fundamentally, we all are saying, be nice to dogs, so please don't hurt them in the way as you guide them through their lives to sh that they share with us. Um, the level of expertise and like my chapter, I think it's chapter four, which is on reactivity. So the Midnight Dog Walkers was all about reactivity because that's what I was heavily immersed in. And that's still the number one problem, according to studies, reactivity followed by separation anxiety, followed by all the other <laughs> issues that um, owners have. And a, a huge study said that 70, almost 75% of owners have reported behavior problem, which to me is different than the dog won't sit or, you know, the what pulls on the leash. They're seeing, the owners are seeing it as and calling it a behavior problem. Um, but when I look at the book and that everything is in there from a distance, I'm, I'm just floored that like my chapter, that's what I'm talking about, my chapter three, chapter four, I keep saying it's chapter three, chapter four about reactivity. I have um, three experts in there and they, one person talks about the, the mind and the cognitive reappraisal and giving the dog a chance to assess things, which is of course, Dr. Laura Donaldson. Um, and then I moved to Sarah Fisher, which is the body is a way that I'm just kind of say, saying that she's talking about, she's way more than that but um, hands off looking at the body and looking for pain and that sort of thing and ruling that out. And she is way more than that. And then Kim Brophy was in that chapter with her legs program. And to me, it's, it's the legs, it's all four legs of the dog and kind of puts it all together. And um, each chapter just has like, just, it just floors me. The people in the book floor me more than the book itself. I'm just thrilled about it, that part. I mean, the whole thing, but. And of course, um, I think it's very telling that uh, you, you've shared with me that it, it ended up being a completely different book to what you're going to write initially on that particular topic when thinking about in inverted commas reactivity. And uh, and um, this is the this is the thing I think moving forwards uh, we've got to move away from having these discussions based within that kind of operant um, area, the operant merry-go-round, as I call it, because. All this wonderful richness that we're learning actually pushes us way, way away from the, the conversations about tools and methods, actually, because, you know, recognizing that, you know, I know from my own experience that all the dogs I, I work with who are classed as the more complex cases, every single one that I've worked with, I can think of as being in pain, I mean, phys physical pain often, uh, but also emotional pain or social pain, you know, a lot of the stuff that uh, people like Rachel Leather and uh, Lord Donaldson and Holly Tatt and others talking about trauma, uh, understanding all these things. I think if you had a, an aversive trainer here, um, we could just ask, do you understand about pain? Do you understand about trauma? Do you understand about social sensitivity? You know, going through those lists, because if the answer is yes to any of those things, then you wouldn't be using those tools. I, I think it's as simple as that. So um, a, a book like this is going to be really important to help keep shifting forwards. It's like when uh, Linda Michaels brought her book out. You've got your book out now. Uh, I think we're, we're starting to see some exciting things coming out onto the market, really, which are just pushing away from that. Yeah. And I think when an owner, when we, we can reach an owner, first we have to reach the trainers who are teaching the owners. But when an owner or a trainer start, looks at that reactive dog, that it's 
often the lunging and screaming on the leash on walks and walks are no longer enjoyable. And if we can switch it in the owner's mind from this is a bad dog, this is a stubborn dog, this is a dog that's embarrassing me on my walk to this is a dog having a hard time and not coping with the situation. And I've been saying lately that you don't fix a problem on a, on a, a walking problem on the walk. It has to start way back with what Laura calls, Donaldson calls deep safety. And if you like, I begin anything I do when I, when I work with a dog now, and I ask myself, if, if what I'm about to do for this dog, is it going to increase the bond between the dog and the owner, or is it going to decrease it? And it's very simple which way to go, because any aversive tool, anything that, that creates fear um, or avoidance or a shutdown dog decreases the bond. And mm -hmm. I think the bond got lost. Um, in the, all of the science and all the quadrant fighting and all the my science is better than yours and my got who I studied it knows more than who you studied with and that's what I, I really I mean you too we're focusing on the bond and what does the dog need in front of us and relief you talk about relief like I feel like my job now as a practitioner is relief for the dog from its stressors in a way that can work for the human when possible. Yeah, relief for both ends of the lead, of course. And I think, um, and the, the beautiful thing is, you know, I, I uh, kind of coach and mentor other professionals who are looking to move to more, you know, this kind of working. Uh, and that, yes, there are some people who, for, for their own reasons, often can't see beyond labeling that behavior and expecting there to be a consequence. And quite often those who want to see a harsh consequence, we have to ask or wonder about their own upbringing, their, their own attachments, of course. But the vast majority of people, they, they really care about their dogs. And I think it's a relief for them, Annie, that they know that they aren't expected to do tons of training. They're not expected to, that actually their dog isn't broken, that there's, no, you know, there's nothing there to fix. Um, and I think that's that's a big reliever, I think, actually, because a lot of the time, the stuff that you and I educate on, it's asking them to do less often, not more. Yeah, I took a line from a, a cowboy I learned in Texas because I, I had horses and went to all these horse clinics and I had a new huge horse that I didn't know very well. And he was very powerful. He was a former pony horse on the San Antonio racetrack. And those are usually just big, strong horses. And he had been that for all of it for 15 years. So here I was going to turn him into a trail horse and um, I didn't know the horse and he didn't know me. So I went to a clinic to get to get help with it. And I was all over, I, I later I rode without a bit or, and I never wore spurs, but I had a small bit in his mouth and I was this turning and turning because turn, I kept turning his neck because I was terrified he was going to buck me because he had bucked and he was one of the biggest horses I ever had. And the guy yelled at me and, and because he yelled, I remember it. And which is not the best way to train, but I did. It did get through my fear. And he said, do less faster on that horse. Get out of his mouth. Leave him alone. I was I was making it worse by yeah. micromanaging because I was afraid. And that's um that's a really important point, isn't it? I think if we if we kind of just roll that out a little bit, I think I think a lot of the general public have been kind of ushered into a, a state of micromanaging a lot uh, and um, almost creating issues that then have to be trained out of. And I see that a lot, especially in early development with puppies and, and adolescent dogs, of course. Uh, and we met, uh, just thinking back through the Midnight Dog Walkers book, of course, that's because uh, I think I reached out to you because I was um, a fan of, the, of that book. And, and it's still, you know, it's, it's a great book still, and I, I'd highly recommend People um, have a look at the, the old book as well as getting the, the new book, of course. Uh, so um, on Monday, um, half past six UK time, over on the Interdogs um, page, Association of Interdogs, um, Denise has put together a bit of a panel. So th there's quite a few contributors, including myself, from the book. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening on Monday. Yeah, we're going to have a, it's kind of funny because we did this uh, sim similar for a year ago because we thought the book was coming out a year ago. So we've kind of had a book launch two or three times because the date kept moving. Uh, but for this is for real because I have it confirmed from the publisher that the books are have gotten to the warehouse and now they're they're moving out into the bookstores and Amazon and all that. So I know the book is here. So for sure we're having a book launch party online 
um, this coming Monday with um, some of the experts that are in the book, many um, of who are like I'm a, I um, certified through Association of Into Dogs and so are many of the, not many, but several of the behaviorists that I, I talk to. And so um, I think if we're all just going to come together and finally exhale <laughs> because everyone has been so patient. I mean, I, when I sent the interviews to be um, for the final edit to most of them, this, I think this last spring, or like in January, most everybody said, I don't know what we talked about because that was two years ago. <laughs> so the book's kind of new to all of us and myself too. I'm like, I wrote that because you just kind of move on to the next project. But anyway, that's gonna be live and um, we're just gonna celebrate the book launch, celebrate everybody who's in it, maybe go around and talk about what, they're, what they shared in their interviews. Um, and I think it's just gonna be a lot of fun. And I, I, again, I think part of the healing journey for me has been connecting with colleagues. And so, and the college, and it's other trainers who put Midnight Dog Walkers on, on bestseller list and kind of had an underground cult following. Mm. I wrote it for owners and I wrote this one for owners, but it's the trainers who have lifted this book up, um, whether they're in it or not, and um, told their, everyone that they work with about it. And so there, there's just a lot of healing in talking to people who have the same life experience or business experience that you have especially because we all care so deeply about dogs. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and people can um, come watch and ask questions and I uh, hope you'll be there on Monday. I think it's 1130 yeah. mountain time. Yeah, and I think, uh, I don't know how Denise is doing it because also Denise is a bit of a bit of a internet whiz. Uh, but <laughs> if it's possible, we can uh, we can also uh, get it shared out into the Dog Centre Care Group at the same time. Maybe I don't know how these things happen. But yeah, so look out for that as well. Look out for the book. Yeah, I did it. Was, we've had you on a few times I think in the group over the last couple of years and each time part of the reason for coming in was to just was to launch the book and then of course we've had to think <laughs> of something else to talk about so I didn't want to not miss the point but I think we'll we'll get you back again I think um you know, <laughs> during the summer so we can just have a session just on the book because I think there's a lot we can discuss there and share with people for sure people believe me <laughs> they have it in their yeah, hands that's right yeah I, I saw you were very keen to show it I actually have it it's really <laughs> it's okay real. right Good. So you've kind of touched on a couple of things there that I want to bring us around to now then. So um, uh, because you, you mentioned about connecting with colleagues and how you kind of left the industry initially uh, in a, you know, quite burnt out and, and a little bit kind of demoralized about things. And actually, it was this project that kind of got you back into thinking about stuff. But I, I think many of us would recognize there has been a bit of a shift in, in recent years, I think, uh, to the dog training and behavior professional community being uh, a little bit more tricky to navigate. I, I think I think there's been examples of uh, some some quite dramatic fallouts, which can happen, I know, in time, but but also some toxicity. I think that that we kind of feel, and um, I think it's worth mentioning before we go into this and talk about the the uh, Phoenix Advocacy Center project that you've started at the initiative, which is brilliant. I think it's worth mentioning right at the beginning that the vast majority, in my opinion, I think you'd agree, Annie, the vast majority uh, of our colleagues um, are uh, emotionally mature, uh, compassionate, caring, sensitive people who uh, avoid the drama where they can, um, don't aren't, aren't looking to kind of go into uh, well, some there's been some examples of people just going in for the kill from a career point of view. But but I think it's worth mentioning the vast majority. I call them the silent majority, actually. And it's a shame, you know. I had somebody contact me recently. Um, I mean, this is this is heartbreaking, and and it makes you wonder how many people were losing their voice because they they messaged me uh, to ask if I could have a look over a article that they'd written, which they were thinking about sharing in dog center care. So I I had a look at it. It was brilliant. I said, oh, my God, yeah, please put this in the group. And then a few days later, I had another message saying, uh, the reason I wanted to have a look at it and, I, and I've hesitated to put it in the group is because I wrote something several years ago. And whilst the majority of the comments were really supportive, some of them were really nasty and it stopped me from putting anything else out. Uh, and it's it's a real challenge, isn't it, Annie? I think when we think about how uh, you know, you see people writing things on their own business page. I saw this recently with a colleague of mine uh, uh, who put things out on their own business page, 
uh, to communicate to the general public, to the lay person, to have another professional, somebody that we all know is very good at schooling others for some very small errors. And I, and I was thinking, wow, what does this look like to the general public? And, you know, any of the general public who peek into our industry, what must it look like to see professionals acting in a non-professional way? Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, there are so many recent examples, and there will be next week and tomorrow and, uh, of infighting, for lack of a better word, and toxicity on the force-free side. And that is very, very depressing. And that's one reason I was not optimistic uh, before I wrote the book. And there was a, a couple of famous pod podcasts where some, some people that we thought were all force-free said some things that really kind of put a chasm in the middle of the industry. And I had some, um, we were discussing it in the Midnight Dog Walkers group, which is owners and trainers. And I had some owners reach out to me and go, I don't know what's going on, but you guys are really upset. <laughs> this has really upset the entire industry, or at least the, the that she was seeing. And owners are watching us and other trainers are watching whatever we say, even if you're on your private, so-called private page, there's nothing private really on the internet. And I think it, it takes a toll. And that when I, we talk about burnout, so many of the trainers who leave talk about that because they contact me and they say, I can't put up, I don't know who to trust. It doesn't feel safe. Mm. It's safe on our so-called our side, those people who are unwilling to use force and will take an ethical stand, then it's, you feel very lonely and isolated. And I think that's one reason I think this book made such an impact on my life personally, because I don't feel isolated anymore. And I did like most trainers, I think we feel very isolated. And tribal, that's the other thing. I cannot stand it if somebody gets mad at this trainer and this trainer and they have a fight on their personal, local personal page and then everybody piles on. Like this, if you saw that happening, say they were, you were watching doctors, not that we're compared, well, yeah, a lot of us have the intelligence to be doctors, but whatever. Say they're doctors and you're a patient and you see them going at each other and attacking each other, you would lose faith in both, both of them that were doing it it's it's distressing and, and I hope it stops and um, what I've done as a result of this book because you never know what one what you start on a project and you never know where it's going to end up like I think your column the um the article the phantom of the operant that was <laughs> it kind of blew the training world up and that was many years ago and that had an impact on me beyond the operant, operant had an impact on me um, this book had an impact on me and every all everything that I wrote about with the interviews so much so that I got, I, I'm like, where, where do we go if we're professionals and we want support, like emotional, where are we talking about our mental well-being and our physical well-being? And there are organizations and really good organizations, and I'm a member of many of them. Um, and I feel like we're really good at training trainers how to train dogs and behavior stuff. There's incredible courses out there. I don't know that we talk about the mental health that it takes to be, in, we're, an, we're in animal welfare. And I don't think we think of that ourselves as that. And we're also entrepreneurs. Most people, most of us own our own company and work by ourselves or have staff. Um, there's not as many franchises on our side as on the aversive side. Um, and it takes a toll. I mean, most entrepreneurs, most new companies don't, don't make it. And we have had many, many, many that do make it and sustain, or they pull out like I did for five years because I could, I had the luxury of doing that. Most people don't. And I, I could only do that because of my husband. And he, cause he was employed and he, he was fine with it. Um, so I created as a result of this book, as a result of me finding literally beyond the operant, um, this is why I want people to create and not be afraid to create because it has ripple effects down the road. Um, I started the Phoenix Advocacy Center with 24 other professionals. I just asked in the Midnight Dog Walkers one day, is anybody interested in volunteering and helping me start this and bam, 24. And we um, kept it small just so that, because we had to get specific training. And, but what it is, is peer-to-peer -peer support um, for canine professionals, not just trainers. And it can be veterinary, it can be vet staff, groomers, walkers, doggy daycare, whatever. As long as you're force-free, as long as you're committed to not harming an animal, you're welcome in the group. So we started, a, we got the peer-to-peer -peer support training, which I did not know what peer-to-peer -peer support training was six months ago. And um, all the volunteers paid for the training themselves. And we read, a, there's a huge book on it um, that we got for free and we all read that. And it's been out there for like 10 years in, in big businesses. And I just had never heard of it. And, and I learned a lot from not one more vet organization. They, they've done that first 
and they helped guide us. And I consider us kind of a sister organization to them. And they have, I think, 30,000 veterinary professionals in their Facebook group, and they've been around for seven years. And we just started in um, April with our group. And the converse, it is private. You know, you have to be vetted to get in. And um, the conversations there are just, they floor me. And, and what also floors me is um, the amount of support that people who haven't had the specific training that our moderators and volunteers have, like how to um, help without solving the problem, how to show, show up and support, which I had to learn that because we're, we solve problems as trainers. Um, I had to not try to fix things for people um, because that's in the end, not really all that helpful. People want to be seen and heard basically. And so I feel like the Phoenix Advocacy Center and dogs want to be seen and heard for who they are too. It's very similar. Um, I, I started that not by myself. Um, it's not me. <laughs> I just named it that because I, I spent a month trying to find, find a name and I do like the Phoenix allegory. And I'm just like, that's what it's going to be. We mostly call it the PAC, the PAC. Um, and uh, it's the moderators and everybody being very vulnerable. You talk a, lo a lot about being vulnerable, but you have to have a safe space before you can allow yourself to be vulnerable. And the industry has lacked that for decades. I, I actually went through a grief period when we started it and I started learning about peer-to-peer -peer support. I'm like, where have our peer-to-peer -peer support been? You know, where, where's that emotional connection? And I think that's why the book changed me so much because I felt that from the people that I interviewed. So that's the purpose of the Phoenix Advocacy Center is to advocate for positive reinforcement trainers for their needs, um, for what keeps them sane because we've lost too many that just leave uh, out of burnout. I left, um, some of our moderators left and came back and they're now helping other trainers. It's, it's a hard industry, it's a hard job, period. And especially if you care deeply about animals and dogs and that's why we got into it because we care. Yeah, and you know, I think probably connected maybe to the 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 dramas that we see online is is the fact that we do have an emotional health crisis in our in our community. You know, like say burnout, uh, compassion fatigue, uh, all these kind of things. You know, people listening in who's heard me speak before know about my husband, Joe Kieran. He's a he's an end of life nurse. A lot of people would see that as being one of the more challenging jobs. But even Kieran says he couldn't do our job, Annie. I think that that says something. You know, everybody does that has their own their own calling, of course. But um, you know, we turn up to the suffering of others on a daily basis. Uh, and I, you know, I talk about this with some of the workshops I do about emotional health because I'm really passionate about it. Uh, because where is the education on things like ensuring that healthy self esteem, those healthy boundaries that we need the ability to be vulnerable rather than feel vulnerable and finding those different safe spaces and uh, I think that the wider uh, community and industry which has been very good at selling courses selling associations selling memberships but not so good on the pastoral care mm -hmm. or even knowing what that looks like yeah like I look at other professions and we are not by the way considered professionals and I found that by lots of things, but including uh, the US government and the Census Bureau. And I figured that out when I was talking to the, uh, there were five veterinarians who started not one more vet after um, one more vet did kill herself, Sophia Yen, and, and that just put a ripple through our, our industry and theirs. And I asked them, um, how do you know that the suicide rate is really high in veterinarians? I mean, what, where does the university study? Because I didn't know. And they, we do know that, and it's an incredibly hard job. And our job is incredibly hard. And she looked at me, this veterinarian, who was one of the founders, and she goes, we don't know what the suicide ideology, or ideation or rate is among trainers because you're not professionals. And I said, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I paid all this money. I think I should call myself a professional at this point. And it's because the US government started studying veterinarians in the 40s. And so when you die in this country and, and others, they will put your profession on your death certificate. We could, I die tomorrow, it's not gonna say dog trainer because it, the US government doesn't see us as professionals, which is sad and pathetic, like mm. hairdressers and nail techs. And I love all my, my hair people and my neck tech people. They have more requirements than we do and they mm. are professionals. And so, because we're all over the place and anybody can claim to be a dog trainer. So that floored me. And I realized we don't know the level of despair 
and um, loneliness and depression. Mm -hmm. I just know it firsthand from people telling me and experiencing myself. I mean, I was done. I had five happy great years. I started mm -hmm. painting furniture, uh, chalk painting furniture and selling it. And I didn't care where that furniture lived. It was none of my business and the furniture had no feelings. And mm. so it, it just takes such an emotional toll and you have to be emotionally strong to take all of it that comes at you from all different directions. Um, and and I, I think we've done, like people have shared so much already and been willing to be vulnerable and the amount of support and the amount of I've been there too, that happened to me as well. Yes. Here's how we, you know, got through it. Um, it's just, it's, it's, I finally, finally at almost 60, understood the only way to heal is connection. The only way to heal as a human who, and you've been hurt by other humans is connection. And mm. some of us have that connection with dogs, which is why I think we feel so strongly about them, but it's still a dog. And it's still somebody who can't speak to you. <laughs> it's still sort of a captive animal. So to be willing to be vulnerable with your colleagues, I mean, I, I, I hope the other, I think the other people are because I keep getting comment or people contact me and saying how much it means to them um, that, you know, you have somebody, a client does something really rude to you or mansplains you or we, that call that you get on a Thursday at five that says, if you don't fix my dog tomorrow, I'm going to put it down. How do you uh -huh. deal? you know, and what are the boundaries and how do we build the boundaries to keep ourselves mentally sane? So you don't drop out. I don't want another good trainer to leave. We're, no. we're behind the eight ball in terms of there. I believe there's way more aversive trainers, at least in the States than there are force free. And so we can't stand to lose another really good trainer from burnout. So that's the whole purpose of that that group. And we have big plans where um, I'm filling out the enormous tax work paperwork right now to get our nonprofit status. And um, we hope to have that within 30 days. I'm hoping <laughs> it is quite the process. And once we have that, then we're eligible for grants and sponsorship and people can donate to us and, and take it off their taxes. So we, we have a really good board. Um, there's three of us and we have a, a great volunteer committee and great moderators. And this is all volunteer, nobody's getting paid. Um, that's not the goal. Our goal is to keep people healthy. As the veterinarians told me, they wanna create a life for the veterinarian staff, um, veterinarians and staff that they don't feel the need to escape from. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 that's why I went through a grief period when I started this up because I'm like, I wish I had this. Would I have dropped out if I had had this five years ago, if I had had that community support and didn't mm. feel so alone. I mean, we all have our friends in the industry, but that's different from sticking your neck out. That's what I'm so irritated by is that for years, and that's why most of us aren't in a lot of these training, so-called training groups, because somebody would say, my dog's reactive. What do you think I should do? And I've tried this and this as a trainer. And then you get, well, you're dumb. You're stupid. You did that. Oh, my that's so yesterday. You don't know. That's the wrong quadrant. So they just attack, 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 instead of saying, mm -hmm. this is a colleague putting herself out there or himself and asking for our help. And that's what I'm hoping to do with the, um, we're not really talking about training so much as the emotional aspect of it, but we can mm -hmm. talk about how the aversive stuff or the meanness and the cruelty affects us and how we deal with that. Cause it does affect us. It affects all of us. It does. And I think <clears throat> um, uh, emotional, our emotional health, even if it's, even if we are, and emotional health, you have to work at it, like physical health, you have to work at it. Uh, and even if you have good, healthy self-esteem with healthy uh, healthy boundaries, it doesn't mean that stuff doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, when people come for you, when you get trolled, when you get somebody who's determined to say bad things about you, untrue things about you, we get that a lot. And I think what happens is, you know, as soon as you do put your head above the parapet, put out your work, build a bit of a um, platform to put that work up, you're more likely to get targeted. So, so I can see why people just don't bother. You know, why, why do it? You, you mentioned the Phantom of the Opera um, that I put out a few years ago. Uh, I sat on that for ages, Annie, before I thought, you know, I'm just going to go for it. And um, uh, and again, the, the majority of that, that um, uh, response was positive, but some of the negative stuff was pretty harsh. Uh, and all from outside of the fence. Interestingly, I had balanced trainers get in touch who'd read that article, who said that was the language that made them really think about what they were doing, not having fingers pointed at them 
about how to do task differently. When they read that, they thought, now I know why, you know, these kind of things happen. So actually that was positive feedback. And I just didn't expect it from, from our side of the fence, really. I think it's come along. But, but you talk about connection. Connection and being vulnerable is everything because but we've got to provide that safe space first. So, so there's that expression, isn't it, that hurt people hurt people? There's, there's another expression that people aren't so aware of, which is healed people heal people. And I think this is the key. I think we need to have spaces, like you said, where people say, you know, I, I feel that too, actually. Mm. Uh, and um, I've done some workshops, uh, as you know, on this kind of thing. It's amazing the, the stuff that people bring up when they feel they can. And it's a relief, mm -hmm. mainly because they think, wow, you know, and that's why I think for people who have a, a bit of a platform, it's healthy to share your ups yeah. and downs because we tend to just put the good stuff out, right? All the good stuff, you know, uh, but I think it's good to kind of share the fact that, you know, I've struggled today and I talk a lot about my my drug addiction back along and my my um, mental health breakdown. So just parts of my story. And, and by being vulnerable, you get rid of the element of shame because I won't feel shame for that yeah. because, you know, I, I, I will define myself by what I did about it. But we've all got these different things that people can reach out. Uh, and you're right about some of the things that are written in the group, uh, in the in the advocacy group there, because you know, I, I, I've not seen a negatively worded comment. And this is important because even without meaning to, people yeah. can say stuff that just wasn't particularly written very well, you know. And uh, But actually, I think people are really mindful about what they're writing and they're thinking about it. So it's created, it's fostered that kind of environment. Yeah. And um, I will share something that happened to me because I'm not immune to being attacked. <laughs> I think I've just been out at, out here for so long and so used to it that I just block and go, block and go. It's not like a Teflon shield. I don't even care anymore. But I did because I'm not. They're not going to stop me from producing. Like every now and then, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go, "Oh God, the haters are going to kill me on my Amazon reviews <laughs> when this book comes out." And I'm like, I don't care. I don't read the reviews. I even I don't even read the good ones, and I don't think authors should because it's it's the reviews I think are for the readers. There are people who go there that want to hurt the author for sure, but um, I'm just I, I I appreciate reviews and they're very very important. And so thank you for everyone who does. Um, what was my point with that? Oh, so, so so I do kind of have an attitude of say whatever you want about me. I don't care because I'm I'm focused and I'm going to produce my stuff and the, I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to sit down and shut up and I never will. But I'm almost 60. And so when I wrote the Midnight Dog Walkers in 2015, I was writing for Dogster Magazine and Dogster on, um, Online, which was at the time a pretty big online community. And I was their lead trainer. And I, and I got in trouble for stuff, well, trouble, meaning the trolls came for me and the force free people came for me. One of them was a headline called I'm a soft trainer because an aversive trainer in my community had said, oh, you're just a soft trainer and meant it as quite the insult. And so I kind of flipped it and said, you're damn right. I'm a soft trainer on purpose. But I do remember the night that um, I, the first time I read about Caesar Milan um, because I am not a fan as many of us are not. Um, and in fact, because I, I have been a journalist, I had to go through legal because he sues um, and you had to get every, and I'm a journalist, so, and I've never been sued, knock on wood, because I understand the libel laws very, very well. Um, but I wrote a factual article about him harming some dogs in his care because he filmed it and he put it on his TV show. They came for me in hordes. It was his fans, but also forced, I mean, it was like a feast tearing at my body. And I'm just reading, and this is when I used to read the comments and I, and I quit, I didn't quit for that. I quit because Doxter refused to moderate the comments. And, and most, most major media started moderating because of the hate that the journalists were getting and they refused to do it. And I told them that's why I'm leaving. Um, anyway, I remember reading, they get personal too, you know, because they don't have anything to stand on. And just, and you, your mind remembers that. She's fat, she's this, she's stupid, she, and, or you get doxxed. You know, women, female reporters have been doxxed and so have male. Here's her address. And people have been killed even. So there is a real risk of some danger. But I called my editor who was in, in she worked in Dogster in California. And I said, what is going on? I mean, I expected blowback, but not the personal. Go ahead and attack me on the science or whatever. But it was nasty and mean. And like, they're going to come from in 
be in my front yard in a few minutes with pitchforks. And so we're talking and I just, I had made some popcorn and I poured Hershey syrup, a whole thing of Hershey syrup, dumped sugar on it and drank two bottles of wine and, and discussed it with her. And I'm like, this is appalling. You guys cannot let hang your writers out to, to on the line like that. And that's what happens. Uh, and she did protect me. And then she was like, oh. <laughs> And they never put in precautions. And so a writer who writes for them and they're not gonna back you up, I, I wouldn't do that. But that's what happens on social media. You say mm -hmm. something controversial and the word dog is now controversial. And if they come for you and then they pile on, that is the most lonely feeling. And then you wonder, well, is it worth it? Should I have said that? Because now they are harassing me and they're giving one star reviews and they're um, contacting my clients. I mean, it can get nasty in a hurry and it is real. And it's a threat. Um, and, and so one thing we're doing is educating the members of the Phoenix Advocacy Center. What is libel? What is slander? Because anybody can, I'm going to sue you for libel. <laughs> Good luck. It's, it's highly protected and you have to prove malicious intent. Uh, but that's a threat. Just sit down and shut up. I feel when somebody says you better, I'm gonna, unless you really have libeled them, um, which is not usually the case, but I get so tired of that. Like the person you said was attacked five years ago. It stings. And you mm. have to decide in that moment, should I stick my head up again? Because is this worth it? Is my safety and my family's safety worth it? I'm at the point where a lot of women are my age. I don't care. You know, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. I will just delete you. I will block you. And I'm not going to think about it. It doesn't bother me because, because my support is so much bigger than that. And the feedback, the positive feedback that I get way makes up for the people that want to attack me. But it's hard. It's not easy. And you have to have a thick skin. It is hard. And I think also it doesn't just affect us, Annie. It affects our loved ones. You know, uh, last year I, I had a, there was a little group of people that decided for whatever reason they wanted to come and say horrible things about me, untruthful things about me, behind blocked profiles, uh, personal things, you know. Um, the problem is, of course, Annie, I think, there are people who will believe stuff with no evidence just because somebody whispered in their ear and, and they say, oh, yeah, whatever, uh, when the evidence to the opposite is there. But uh, my husband saw this stuff because he wasn't blocked and he saw these things being written and, and he got really upset by it, very upset, you know, and, um, uh, and it does have a knock on effect for us. And I, and I think it's difficult because, you know, we, we try and do things the best way we can. Uh, and, uh, like you say, we're, we, we're making ourselves be vulnerable by turning up and talking about stuff and putting our work out there and things. And it's even harder, I think, when it's people, um, you know, I, I've, I had a bit of a thing happen recently. Some some people might have seen it because some people kind of came in and supported me, which is nice. But uh, from a, a, a well-known aversive trainer here in the UK using my sexuality about that's why I, I work the way I do, because I'm I'm kind of whatever. Uh, so So that does happen. But I think when it's on our own side of stuff and then they pile in, it's really hard. You know, we had Victoria on um, uh, talking about some of this stuff, Victoria Stillwell, before about you know, when she, you know, she, uh, you know, many of us see Victoria as being um, uh, somebody who's, who's really well known, well known in the public. Uh, and, and it hurts when you see people that you see as colleagues piling in, like I say, people pile in yeah. uh, without thinking about it sometimes. And, and, um, uh, and I think that's the one thing, isn't it? It's about having thought about, is this really relevant for me? What's going on? You know, how am I involved in this? Uh, and we feel sometimes, oh, yeah, I must put something in here to support my friend. But actually, it doesn't quite come out like that, does it? Because you just end up having these kind of things happen. And, um, and that's what makes it very difficult, I think, to kind of navigate sometimes. And I think having the advocacy group, as a first point of call, because we were talking about off air, the one thing that we're missing really is a good arbitration service, good mediator service, uh, where, you know, I might think, oh, I've got some beef with Annie, but rather than get on the keyboard, I'm going to go to that service and say, right, I, I need an independent person to hear both sides. But you're kind of creating that in the advocacy group. And as far as people have, instead of thinking, right, I'm really angry about this, I'm going to do this, I can actually come to that group and post about it in there. And that's one of our rules is don't name other people unless you're unless you're saying something positive and they've been very very good about that mm. but i think arbitration is huge because my god if we can come together on those of us we all agree we don't want to hurt animals 
And if we can quit the fighting and the keyboard warrior and the mean girl crap um, and come together, we will be bigger and stronger and we are the future. We are, we, it's, it's turning, the tide is turning finally. Um, and it's like, if you're gonna attack somebody, attack not necessarily even an aversive trainer individually, because we know what that feels like, attract their tools, attack the pain, attack doing things like you're doing, which shows you don't, you know, your whole, you don't even need to talk about the quadrants because that's not what this is about. This is about safety first. This is about relief first and foremost. You can't give relief to a dog if you're shocking it. You can't build the bond if you're shocking it. Um, so if you want to fight, fight against the tools. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then focus on all of us coming together because there is enormous power in numbers and quit being, quit being tribal, quit being, well, you didn't go to my school and my school's better than your school. And I know the science better than you. None of that helps the dog. None of that helps owners and people get tired of it. And what do they do? They go to the shock dock down the street. We're hurting yeah. ourselves by doing all of this. And it's immature and it's insecure people and they've been hurt, which is no excuse. I've been hurt. <laughs> We've all been hurt. Like you said, healed people can help heal people. And instead think about what can I, can I cross um, this bridge that has come up between me and this other trainer? And sometimes it may be too scary to do it by yourself. And oftentimes it is, but I would much rather be part of that healing conversation or, or facilitate it with somebody smarter than me. Like most of our volunteers astound me because they have been, um, some of them have master's degree in social work. They've, one is a 25 year um, drug abuse counselor that they never talk about. They just do it on their own. And, you, and they know, they knew way more than me. I was one of the few that had to catch up on the, the peer to peer support language. There are people in the group right now that are therapists. So that may be something that, um, well, I would love for us to do that as part of advocacy is just, you come to me and say, I'm, I'm upset because Andrew said this and I, maybe I'm taking it the wrong way or maybe he didn't mean it, but I'm really hurt. And instead of holding a grudge or not ever saying anything, maybe there's a spot where I say, hey, therapist over here, <laughs> could, I'm just going to suggest you guys get together and talk and then decide to or, or not to. And sometimes actually, even like you said there, even having a safe space where you can offload, talk about what it is that you're feeling and your heart and have somebody help you navigate that just in that space because quite often that thing that somebody said or done it isn't always about what they've said and done it's about our history of experiencing about other stuff um and um i think one of the things to think about as well is we were talking about this off air a little bit and that's the the power of of, of, of the word and um which we overlook i think you know um you could write an article a post that I might not agree with. Uh, and that could make me think, right, that's it now. You know, even though we've got a good friendship and we've known each other a while, that one article now, because this is what happens, sadly. You know, but this notion of being friends on Facebook, often you're only one article, one comment, one shirt color away from somebody not liking you and unfriending you. I, I, this is what kind of happens. But, but you can think, do you know what? I don't like what Annie's written and I still respect her friendship and I care about her. You know, we can we can we can bridge two things sometimes by looking at that, um, and also recognizing the notion of compassion. You know what it is and, and what it isn't. I think um, you know compassion isn't isn't finite. That you know we can be compassionate on many levels with many different areas. Um, I think when we think about compassion fatigue, it isn't about the fact that we've been too compassionate. Compassion fatigue for me is the fact that we haven't been compassionate enough for ourselves. That's what compassion fatigue leads is about, really, because we we are lacking in self compassion at that time. But um, uh, compassion is not about condoning or condemning. You you can still have compassion for somebody that you disagree with or you don't like what they've done. You know, again, you know, anybody who wants to have a check on this, really, it's worth just listening to my husband talk about stuff from the hospice. <clears throat> you know, because guess what? Every form of personality life experience comes through that hospice and sometimes in that bed is somebody who they know because sometimes they have people from the prison even <clears throat> who is that they know has done her terrible things yeah but they don't they don't deliver, deliver care any differently because they can still have compassion 
Now, I know that's almost a superhuman thing to have, I know, because it, we can't all be that. But it just shows how, you know, when I hear some of the stories that Kieran shares with me, it's just really humbling. And I, and I, and I, and I can't say I could be that sometimes, actually. We, we, all have, we all have our red lines, I think, things that we can't turn up for, which is cool. But I think generally within our community, I think we can all step back and think, you know, we all do a really hard job. And um, uh, and it doesn't help. And I and I think just thinking about how people word things. One of the things I try and do in in, in dog center care is allow discussions because people need to. And some of the stuff that people share in there is right on the cutting edge of some of the thought process, which is challenging. And that's cool. And we've got to think about it. But one of the things, one of my red lines in the group really is about the language that people use, um, because you can you can start by saying. You know, uh, thank you for offering that post. Uh, from my opinion, these are some things that I think we think you can frame it in a way that isn't combative. I think that's a good word, actually. I mean, a lot of stuff is combative, isn't it? On online, it's, it's like you say, it's two sides having a go at each other, uh, even on our side of the fence. And I don't like words like always and never. Like it just if it just seems feels cold to me if you're writing something as a dog professional and then some another trainer comes in dogs always blah blah, blah. no dogs don't always because they're always in oh, they are always individuals people always that person that community that minority community always or never I don't like um, those words especially online because it's very limiting and I also say that um, you know we're we're trying to bring kindness back into the training community because it's lacking and I think it's lacking for a variety of reasons um, a lot of it is exhaustion and the idea of not having any spoons left to lift anybody else up because you're about ready to quit on any given day because you're just so emotionally depleted um, but I like the idea of what I, I I don't know where I got it I think I might have made it up but credit to whoever came up with it if I didn't I like the idea of what I call fierce kindness like I'm going to be really kind and supportive but that doesn't mean I'm a doormat and that doesn't mean I accept inappropriate, rude, ugly behavior. I'll, I will call people out on it or I'll just, you're gone from my life. Like that's a boundary for me. If you come onto my page and you start attacking me, I'm not there to discuss it with you. If you wanna um, have a discussion and, and come at it with a different type of language, like what you said really upset me and or I feel, I feel this about what you're writing, then I'm more than happy to discuss it. But if it's like full on, you're a stupid idiot, then the conversation mm. won't happen. And I think so much of this is educating. Like I said, I did not know what peer-to-peer -peer support was. And the veterinarians started telling me about it and, and they helped us pick out, or they showed us the training that they had and we picked out training for our group. And it's just been eye-opening. And like to, at 60, to learn something new that you thought, because I've studied trauma so much because I've had so much of it in my own life, and it's like, it just keeps the same with the dog world. There's always something new to learn. And the whole idea of peer-to-peer -peer support has been sorely lacking in mm -hmm. the fourth community. And there's so many reasons, and I really don't like it. It's depressing. That's why I said I went through a grief process is we, like, why wasn't this there all along? Why, why didn't the leaders 30 years ago, even though they had to break down walls <laughs> and they were attacked even more viciously than we were for saying, use a clicker <laughs> than beating your dog. Um, but it, it was missing and mm. tribalism was allowed to be grow rampant. And I, I would encourage anyone, if you own a school or certification, um, and if you see your members being tribal and rude online, um, that that's one of your ethical lines, you know, they're not kicked out immediately, but they, you might get in touch with them and say, could you, I say, could you consider reframing the way that you wrote yeah. that? And that's important, isn't it? Because I think <clears throat> very easy to, you know, you and I were both accredited by Interdogs, which has a really strong ethical code. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to set the, the charter up here in the UK <clears throat> was to not only draw a line in the sand regarding methods and tools, but also provide accountability for professional conduct. So the general public can, and other professionals can, if they have a grievance, take it to an independent aspect of that so the facts can be looked at you know the kind of he said she said yeah. it doesn't get anywhere often but if there are factual things if i can if i have evidence that i have been like you said um uh libeled or slandered or or there's an element of professional conduct then there is some accountability there and and that means a lot to me one i, I understand some colleagues who 
I think one, you know, there's so many different things and until we get uh, government sanctioned regulation, what's the point in being accredited? I get that. But for me, the main reasons I have my accreditation is because I want to provide accountability. Yeah. So actually, um, we do have to do stuff. If you look at our stuff for into dogs, we do have to have an element of professional conduct. You know, if people really don't feel that I'm fulfilling that, they do have a, a course of complaint, which I think is important. But um, uh, but one of the things we do into dogs is not look at disciplinaries as such, but as a first book, depending on what the problem was, of course, but the first book of call is looking at coaching and education. That should always be the first point. It shouldn't be jumping in saying, right, you're going to be banned, you're going to be this. It should be right. What coaching and education can we look at here so you can you can kind of do better, really? I, I think that's, a, that's an important part of it. Uh, right. Well, that's we've that's whiz by, Annie. Uh, <laughs> so before we go, though, this is an important topic, I think, um, and uh, we'll definitely <clears throat> uh, share some links for the advocacy group. And like you say, everybody's vetted who goes in, and and there's a there's a general uh, understanding about the rules of being in there, which I think is important. Uh, share with us any any last thoughts that you, that you want to share with us on, on that topic, really. Um, one is I do encourage people to put their work out there and not be so afraid because you have things that you can do to protect yourself, including blocking. Um, I have a 3000 person. I found it the other day block list on Facebook and I'm surprised it's that small. And those are not 3000 dog trainers. Um, probably a 10% might be, and they might also be on the force free side because I don't put up with rudeness or cruelty from just because somebody's a force free trainer. Um, I certainly block averses. I pre-block them because so, I don't want them to, I don't want to see their stuff, like their franchises. I'm not going to say their names, but in the United States, you know that they have electric shock collars and they sell them. I just pre-block. Um, I, I don't want them to know what I'm doing with my life. It's none of their business. They don't have the right to be part of my social network as much as I can help it in online. There's nothing wrong with blocking. That's a boundary. Um, mm. You don't maybe block, uh, Denise calls me the block queen. And I have kind of calmed down the, on the blocking because, but what I will also do if I'm bored, I consider it a hobby because I am a journalist. And so the word, some of the nastiest comments are on local town groups because they're not moderated, um, garage sale, whatever, and media stories. And they're outright trolls. People have nothing better to do. And what I ended up doing for my little local town, I blocked it. I, they weren't talking to me. They were rude and nasty and, and bullying to other people like, what's the weather on Highway 40? Oh, you're so stupid. Look it up online. Block, 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 block. Because I do not want to see it. And now mm. when a, a, a post that I know is going to sit the bullies out, just an innocuous post. I, I'll see 40 comments and I'll have 20 blocked. It's the same 20 people mm. in the community. So I really encourage people to pre-block to do that have courage to put your stuff, stuff out there, but you can put protections. We have a whole anti-bullying um, guidelines in the Phoenix uh, Advocacy Center, what you can do prior and what you can do after. And that's part of our advocacy is we wanna help you with that up until legal point. I wanna have legal counsel eventually, which is why we have to get the nonprofit to have money for that. Um, we can't do that right now, but that's what we wanna work to. Um, and, and find your safe people and be a safe person. I think you first of all you have to be safe before yeah. you know you can't demand others be safe for you if you're not a safe person back um find your tribe and expand your tribe as well um you can be friendly tribes with other people and seek to um bring the temperature down in conversations instead of bring it up that's stressful for everybody even if you kind of like the excitement of it um seek to add a positive word instead of a negative word or don't say anything at all but i'd rather you say something positive if you're going to say anything um and and also just know there's more support for you both as dog owners and professionals than you can imagine but you got to ask you got to show up um i didn't know that all these people were going to say yes when I, I i have i think 12 chapters and there's 17 interviews everyone could have said no for whatever reason too busy i don't know you I don't want to have my name in a book that might be controversial. Um, they all said yes. And you get more confidence if you put yourself out there and you get some, but you got to put yourself out at least in the beginning to very safe people in safe places. 
and it's worth it. So I think the word there that sums all that up is 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 safety again. You know, we talk about this with dogs, but it's the same with us, and we have to create our own safe space, really. And I think that's the that's the only question we need to ask. Do I feel safe with this? Yeah. And if you if the answer is no, then you have to think, right, do I still need to look at this, in which case I need more boundaries in place to stay safe, or you move on. Mm -hmm. And I think this is this is important, you know, the chance to scroll on, the chance to block. Um, you know, this is not unkindness. I think one of the big mistakes Facebook especially had was calling what are basically acquaintances friends. Yes. Because it because it because it makes you and especially you know it makes you feel bad if somebody's unfriended you and it makes you feel bad if you unfriend somebody else. But in fact, it's just these kind of these kind of virtual connections that you create. And and it's like any relationship, it is only time and situations that come along. I think about Denise. Um, I know Denise is still listening, but um, you know, Denise and I have known each other a long time. I know you and Denise have as well, and we've been through a lot of stuff together. We've had all sorts of challenges when I was chairing into dogs and, and Denise came on as, as my kind of vice chair and the things we have to deal with and tackle. And it's only through those ups and downs that you think, actually, yeah, you're still here. Yeah. And so that's the same in real life, actually, as well as in, as well as in the virtual world. Uh, brilliant. Well, that's been amazing. So thank you so much, Annie. Uh, we'll make sure we share these things. Um, just to let everybody know, um, the book launch, yay, on Monday, 6.30, Interdogs, uh, the Association of Interdogs, Facebook page. I'll speak to Denise, see if we can get it kind of shared into the group as well so we can get more traction on it. <clears throat> uh, the 28th, um, the amazing Robert Fultman Taylor is continuing on his series of interviews with Julie Daniels with some amazing research, kind of connected actually, Annie, because Julie's research is looking about how um, effective we are with our clients and, and the communication and the connection and how to best bring them along with what we need to do for the dogs, which is important. And then on the 6th of July, we've got Jennifer um, Shryock looking at infants and dogs. This is going to be a really good one. Um, infants and dogs, what do they have in common? What a great title. Uh, so Jennifer is going to take us through some of that as well. Uh, amazing. Well, thank you so much, Annie. And um, we'll get you back again maybe later on in the summer just to talk about the book more because I think there's a lot of stuff we can unpack there for sure. But, but thank you for today. Thank you. I always appreciate this conversation. I think they're very important to have. And I hope that if people are listening, contact me, contact Andy. Come If you're a professional, come join us at the Phoenix Advocacy Center. It's called the Members Group. Um, and find those safe places because they exist. We just don't know how how frequent these places are because we're so beaten down but have faith because i was very very skeptical and if i can find a safe space it exists and i'm here to tell people that they, they are out there they're very qualified kind safe professionals that are have your back yeah that's a great message to send so stay safe everybody and um see you again soon look after yourselves bye bye annie